the reason I love the Gideons is they are not only honed in and focused on getting the Bible out, they love pastors and they love churches. It's a great ministry. Our Savior King, Jesus is never identified in the New Testament as simply personal Savior. It's always Lord and Savior, Prince and Savior, King, because of the authority that He has from God. We're going to be looking today for a few minutes at this authority of Jesus Christ. It's questioned in the passage under consideration today. I want you to turn in your Bibles to Mark chapter 11, looking at verses 27 to 23. I'm so grateful for Jared James bringing the Word of God to you this past Sunday in my absence. So grateful for Norman Hare standing on Sunday night and walking you through more uh, very good, solid, practical information about following Jesus Christ day by day. It's good to have faithful men. We had a wonderful time in Cape Coral, Florida, celebrating my brother's 30th anniversary. Uh, it was just, it was, it was excellent. It was excellent. Well, Mark chapter 11, verses 27 to 33. Stand with me if you would. If you don't have a Bible, we'll have the text on the screen for you, but we definitely want to get a Bible in your hands. You need your own copy of the Scriptures. You can't carry these screens with you when you leave here. Follow along as I read this passage. And they came again to Jerusalem, and as he was walking in the temple, the chief priest and the scribes and the elders came to him, and they said to him, By what authority are you doing these things, or who gave you this authority to do them? Jesus said to them, I will ask you one question. Answer me, and I will tell you by what authority I do these things. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? Answer me. They discussed it with one another, saying, If we say from heaven, he will say, Why then did you not believe him? But if we, if, shall we say from man, they were afraid of the people. Well, they all held that John really was a prophet. So they answered Jesus, We do not know. And Jesus said to them, Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. We just read together what? The inerrant infallible, all-sufficient Word of God. May we be taught from this today to understand more clearly the authority of Jesus, understand more clearly human authority, and learn some things from how Jesus handled uh, these religious elitists. Thank you. Please be seated. On the question of authority, all authority is derived authority unless it resides in God our Father, in Jesus Christ our Lord, or the blessed Holy Spirit. Other than that, all authority is derived. Any authority that, that you may have as a parent over children is derived from God. In fact, I've got an article coming out in this week's Owasso Reporter on fatherhood that speaks to this, this reality. To the extent that we parent as under God, according to God's Word, we have authority. We deviate from that, we lose our authority. The authority of a pastor to bring the word, to have a people, to pastor and shepherd, is derived from God. Paul says, follow me as I follow Christ. If I veer off and don't follow Christ, you don't follow me there. You see, all authority, kings, princes, presidents, legislators, their authority is derived from God. These religious leaders are asking the one who has original authority where he got his authority. Their very authority is derived from him. And so this interplay, this exchange that Jesus has with them is, is very telling because you see, part of their problem was that number one, they were not adhering to the Old Testament revelation, particularly the Levitical matters, which taught them their code of conduct, their, their functioning, they were not operating under God. They said they were, but they were not. And this is where Jesus challenged them over and over. On a couple of times in the New Testament, he says, Have you not read? That's an insult to a, to a scribe, to an elder, uh, to a Pharisee, to, to the religious leaders, to the Sadducee. You see, have you not read? That was their life, was reading the Old Testament. Their life was bringing it to the people. 
And so they've deviated from that. In fact, not only that, they've added to it. They've added their own uh, appendages. They've added their own interpretations, which are different from the Scripture. And so this is a, this is a clash of authorities. Next week, Lord willing, we're going to look at uh, the passage we began on Mother's Day, finish it up on Father's Day, and think about the fathers, the husbands, authority. As Jesus engages in this latest contentious encounter with the religious leaders, he responds to their question with a question that they dare not answer aloud. And by doing so, he exposes their hypocrisy and demonstrates that they are without any real derived authority from God because they are out of step with God's will, His Word, and His way. I want us to see in this passage, uh, four, we're going to look at it from four angles, all right? First, the religious leaders question Jesus' authority. Second, Jesus shows His authority with a tricky question in response to them. Third, the inquirers expose their hypocrisy by their answer. And then Jesus asserts His authority. As we read through this, it's important to remember if we claim to be followers of Jesus Christ, we only can do so legitimately under the Lordship of Jesus Christ. When we go our own way, consider His way, not the wise way, we, we lose any claim to being His. Jesus said, if you love me, what? If you love me, you'll keep my commandments. We'll obey Him. So let's look first of all at this, the religious leaders question Jesus' authority. It says they, as Jesus and the disciples came again to Jerusalem, remember we're in, this, we're in this last week leading up to his crucifixion. As he was walking in the temple, so he's back in the temple setting, he's already done what previously that we studied? He has cleansed the temple. He has demonstrated a, a holy, righteous indignation for how they were merchandising in a place that was supposed to be a house of prayer for all the nations, a place where, where they were to do their due diligence prior to in preparing for the sacrificial season of Passover. And they turned it into an occasion of convenient religion, convenience on the part of the people who were supposed to make genuine, sincere preparation prior to, and then the money changers seizing the opportunity to cash in on the convenience mentality. You could call it the consumer mentality of those who were coming for Passover. He's already cleansed the temple. He's, he has caused a no shortage of anger and upset at the way he has acted. He has passed a fig tree full in bloom. Typically blooms on a fig tree mean they're figs. This, this fig tree is full of leaves empty of fruit and he curses it and it withers and dies and again a parable in action in word and in deed of how he viewed Judaism in his day so these religious leaders approach him they were priests chief priests scribes elders they're representatives of the Sanhedrin and they said to, them, to him, by what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? You have to understand the question behind the question, or the observation behind the question here. The way that they ask this question, implicit in this is they're saying, we did not give you authority to do what you're doing. You didn't get this from us. And because you didn't get it from us, why do you think you have any authority? In Jesus' day, if a Pharisee, a scribe, one of, the, one of the ruling council of the Sanhedrin, if they approached you as, a, as an average Jew and began to inquire of you, particularly if their, if their inquiry was, was uh, one of suspicion, one apparently leading toward accusation, you would have much dread and fear as a Jew. And one of the things you would dare not do is not answer them, unless you could point to someone else. Remember the, the man born blind in John 9? Jesus heals him. Well, he, he goes before the leaders and, and they said, uh, tell us about this man. He can't be from God. The fellow says, well, 
All I know is that I was blind and now I see. You know any mere man that can do that? And then he asked this question, why do you want to so much about him? Do you want to be one of his followers too? And therefore the man identifies himself as a follower. Well, they had talked to his parents. They said, tell us about this son of yours. Was he really born blind? Is, what's going on here? Watch his parents. His parents fear these leaders. And their answer is, ask him. He's of age. And they do end up, by the way, putting him out of the synagogue. That's the climate in which Jews were being raised. And on the scene burst Jesus, called a rabbi by his followers, identified as a prophet by those who were, had more than a passing curiosity to what he had to say, what he was able to do in terms of healing. And here's this encounter. By what authority are you doing these things? Or who gave you this authority to do them? That's because we didn't. That's implied there. We didn't give it to you. You're operating without authority. Now, Jesus knows these people very well. He knows their thoughts. We're going to look at that tonight as we're looking at the second part of Come and Follow Me, considering how Jesus is looking for a bold faith, a daring faith, and he, he shows his disciples this. They're whispering in that passage in Mark chapter 2, whispering among themselves, who can forgive sins but God alone? Jesus knows that. Why do, you, why do you say that? So he knows these people very well. And he begins to, we would say, flex his authority. And he does so by asking them a tricky question. He says to them in verse 29, I'll ask you one question. Answer me, and I'll tell you by what authority I do these things. By the way, if you look at if you compare the gospels side by side, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, you know that at this point he has already said previously that what he's come to do is come to do the work of the Father, that he can he says nothing except what the Father gives him to say. He does nothing except what the Father shows him he should do. So he's already expressed this to them. That he, he believes and asserts that his authority is from God. This isn't the first time that Jesus has spoken to this. But on this occasion, the nature of them coming to him and pressing him and basically implying that he has none, Jesus turns the tables on them. It's not the first time Jesus has answered a question with a question. But this particular one stuns them. And here's his question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from man? And then he adds this. And I wish I could have been there to hear it. Answer me. Answer me. And he's, he is, I believe, imposing his authority on them implying his authority over them. You see, these people were not, were not answerable to anyone except themselves. As a typical Jew, you would never have walked up to one of these folks and said, I got a question for you, and I want an answer. You wouldn't have done that to them. And so here is the great standoff. And make no mistake about it, everything Jesus says and does is calculated and it will further incense them and inflame them and it will build an intensity until they hand him over to the Romans to be crucified. And he knows this very well. And so along the way, he's going to continue to expose them. Well, that's the tough question. Was the baptism of John from heaven or from men? Answer me. It's interesting in the third point that no one jumped forward quickly to give an answer. And you, you use your imagination here. Here are these fellows. They've come to Jesus in a, in a group. We don't know how many were there. And walked up and said, we need to know where your authority comes from. Jesus said, well, let me ask you a question. Tell me about John's baptism. Ordained by God? Or just something John made up on his own? 
And you can almost see them. They retreat. They huddle together. And they say, how, do you, how should we answer this? If we say it was from heaven, we know what he's going to say to us. Because they rejected John outright. They thought John was a lunatic. If we say it's from heaven, then he's going to ask us, why didn't you believe him? Remember John in the waters with some of these religious leaders, maybe not the same personalities, but some of the religious leaders approached him on the Jordan. And uh, he had some pretty unkind things to say to them when they came to the waters. Sent, they told him, by the leadership to find out more about him. And they're huddled, they discuss, but if we say, we, we can't say aloud that we think it was strictly from man, it was strictly John's idea that there was no, John had no derived authority from, from the true and living God. We say that aloud, there are people around. We lose credibility with the people. You see, the Pharisees operated with an intentional vagary. There were some things that they would not address because they needed to have the people under their control. And you can control people for a little while with a, with a heavy thumb or a, or a heavy boot on their neck, but you cannot continue to control them that way. And part of the control they wanted over the people was was for the people to believe that these Pharisees knew what they were talking about, these religious leaders, that they knew what they were talking about, that they did have it right concerning the interpretation of the Tanakh, of the Old Testament. So here they are, on the horns of a dilemma. And what's going to happen is the very thing they didn't want to happen, but the very thing Jesus intended to happen, and that is to expose their hypocrisy. So they have this little huddle. So they collect themselves, come back to Jesus. And I'm going to tell you something. Their answer, you would hardly ever find one of the religious leaders speaking this out of his mouth. We do not know. You see, they were, the, they were the brain trust of Judaism. They were, the, they were the guys with all the knowledge. That's why Jesus offended them when he said, do you not know? Have you not read? Jesus has put them on the horns of a dilemma so difficult that they're, they're thinking that there is no answer they can give, therefore they say they do not know, that that in itself exposes them and weakens them as far as their authority is concerned. And then I would suggest to you in this last point that when Jesus has exposed them and actually gotten them to say, we do not know. And now he's going to assert even more intensely his authority over them. His authority to do what he's doing his authority that supersedes them so that he is not answerable to them. And they did not believe it, but he, we know that his authority really was not derived. He's the eternal Son of God, the second person of the Trinity. But in, in the role of Jesus, the incarnate Son of God, he chooses, as Philippians 2 tells us, to place himself under the authority of God. So either way you go, he asserts that his authority is from God. And he's not answerable to them. There are two things said here that were shocking in the relationship of the people, or by, by the way, any rabbi to the religious leaders. One is you'd never hear religious leaders saying, we do not know. And you'd never hear someone responding to them with what Jesus says. Neither will I tell you by what authority I do these things. You don't know, 
Willie, you refused to answer John the Baptist's question, the question I posed about him. Because there is no answer that you can give honestly without exposing yourself. And yet, in your non-answer, in admitting that we don't know, you expose yourself. Remember when Jesus encountered Nicodemus in John chapter 3? He comes to Jesus at night. Rabbi, we know that you're a teacher sent from God, for no one can do the things that you do. Jesus cuts right through all that. He says, I want to tell you, Nicodemus, except you're born again, you'll not see the kingdom of God. In the exchange that's going on there, Nicodemus at one point asks, how can these things be? And Jesus chides him and rebukes him and I think humbles him when he says, You're, you are, remember we looked at this before in, in, in our night studies, you are the teacher, it's a definite article in the Greek, you are the teacher in Israel and you do not know these things? Now in Nicodemus' case, I believe the humbling had a very gracious effect on him. The next time we really see him, he, is, uh, he appears to be arguing for Jesus and he comes right out full force wanting the, the body of Jesus. He's humbled and the result is grace. And here's the deal. Anytime someone's authority is challenged by someone with greater authority, they either humble themselves or they harden themselves. These men harden themselves. And the increased hardening will have the effect of a bloodthirstiness that will develop in them. They have to have him silenced. Because historically in the Gospels, every time they have attempted to silence him, they themselves are either silenced and made to look foolish or speak and are made to look foolish. You see, here's the, here's the interesting thing, folks, for all of us here. We are either being strengthened in the various roles of authority that God gives by tying that to the person and work of the Lord Jesus Christ and His will for those who follow Him. Or we are being weakened and the foundation is crumbling underneath our feet if we determine to go a different way, go another way. Throw off the yoke of his authority and, and simply be, be content to have him in name only. As one writer has put it, too many professing Christians are interested in a cross but not in a crown. In other words, they're fascinated by the cross of Jesus Christ believing that they are saved by the life, death, burial, and resurrection of Christ, but they have no interest in the crown of Jesus Christ and submitting to Him as Lord. And as this writer said, you cannot have the one without the other. You have not the benefits of the cross if you don't bow your knee to the crown. He is the Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. And Jesus shows them that they have no authority over Him. In fact, the passage we read together. It's interesting to me that he would not, at this moment, tell the religious leaders the source of his authority, and yet he gladly tells it when he stands some 50 days or so later on the Mount of Ascension and says to the 500 gathered there, as Paul numbers them, all authority in heaven and on earth has been given unto me. He tells his disciples in the upper room discourse recorded in John's Gospel chapter 13 and following leading up to the trial and crucifixion. I'm going back to my Father. I'm going to prepare a place for you. And since I am going to prepare a place for you, you can be sure I will come again and receive you unto myself so that where I am going to reside eternally there you will be as well what do we learn from this 
People who buck him, who doubt him, who discount him, dismiss him, will continue in their blindness in terms of the authority of Jesus Christ as the Lord. Those who humble themselves before him, who love him with what's been called a repenting faith, that is, we repent of sin, we trust in Christ. And part of the, one of the marks of trusting in Christ is repenting of our sin. Those who love him with a repenting faith, who want to worship him, who adore him, who want to be made like him, who want to tell about him to others. He gladly unveils, unmistakably, without question, the source of his authority. He connects us to God, and he alone does that. I want to, just in closing, I want to just make a couple of observations. I want to be real careful here that you don't misunderstand what I'm saying. You see, Jesus showed us that we are within our rights as his followers, not, not outside of that, as his followers, to not answer someone who is inquiring of us from evil intentions, wanting to know information. Let me sketch this out for you. We don't, we don't live here yet. There are plenty of places around the world where if a follower of Jesus Christ was captured by the authorities, he or she would be threatened and beaten and all sorts of things to give up the names of the people involved in the house church movement that they're a part of. And they're perfectly within their rights not to answer. In fact, and here's why I want to be careful, because I don't, you don't take this and you make a, well, this is how I can live everything. Well, no, no. In, in pressure-packed circumstances, we study in Joshua chapter 2, those first few verses there, in the incident of Rahab, the prostitute. She was asked directly by the emissaries of the king of Jericho, where are these two spies? We have heard that they came to your house. Where are they? If you go back and read that, Rahab's answer is, they went that away, out the city gate. In fact, they were on the roof of her house, hidden. There was a principle taught in Scripture. I want to be very careful because someone can take this and run it to the extreme. When people are wanting answers from you and me in order to, to persecute the people of God, and the reason I teach this is, I believe the day is coming here. I believe it's coming. Rahab was honored by her answer, spared, if you remember, her home was actually built into the wall of Jericho. Does that give you any kind of alarm initially? Because these folks began to march around the walls with the intent of bringing them down. And she was told by the spies as she played with them, she said, I, I have hidden you and protected you. I beg you, please, protect me and my family. Because we, we see that you're from God. People here tremble with fear when they hear about you and your God. And the spies, as they were let down by a rope to go back safely, said, tie a scarlet ribbon outside the window of your place. Have all your family in your dwelling. And if your family caught outside of your dwelling, when these walls come down, will be responsible for their own blood. But if they're all in here, they'll be safe. We pledge that to you. Brothers and sisters, the walls of Jericho collapsed almost completely. There was a section of the wall which took up Rahab's dwelling that did not fall. The whole thing was a miracle. The miracle of God bringing down the, the, that well-fortified walled city and the miracle of a portion of it, specific portion of it, standing. She was honored for this. She is included in the genealogy of our Savior. For lying? No. For breaking the ninth commandment? No. But for recognizing 
the principle taught by our Lord that we're under no obligation to answer authorities who are using their authority to persecute the church of Jesus Christ. We serve a risen Savior. He rules and He reigns and He overrules in majesty even now. And He is coming again. And when He comes again, He is coming for His people, His church. And He comes for a church who is to be prepared like a, a bride prepared for her bridegroom to take her into the marriage. That's why the great gathering we're going to have in the, in the heavens at the consummation of the age is called the marriage supper of the Lord. He's coming for us. He's coming for a church that He expects to be without spot or blemish. One pastor I heard years ago said without spot because she's been washed thoroughly in the blood of the Lamb. Without blemish because she's been pressed powerfully by trial and prepared for a king to come. So I close with it. Who is your authority? Who's your authority? The Pharisees operated thinking that they had tons of authority. And Jesus exposes them as having none. Who's your authority? Mom and dad, my mom always told me, well, that's good if what mom and dad told you they got from the scriptures. Some people act like their authority is the newspaper or, or the 24 7 news cycle. I wouldn't put much confidence in that. We need to derive, recognize we derive our authority and trace it back to this book, the book of books. And recognize that we need to be taught this book by the Holy Spirit, the blessed third person of the Trinity. Our oh, brothers and sisters, make sure that we're not just living, uh, flying by the seat of our pants, as someone said. Make sure that our thoughts are being taken captive by this book. Otherwise, whatever authority we think we may have, Jesus discounts it because He is our authority. He is the only authority. And by the way, we said this before, it's not a question of will you bow to Jesus. It's a question of when will you bow to Jesus because everyone's going to bow. And while you breathe and while there's pink under your fingernails, you can bow and confess Him as Lord to the glory of God the Father and be received into His family and live a life of being conformed to His image as a disciple committed to keeping the Great Commission, to making disciples of all types of people. But if not, you will bow at some point and confess Him as Lord to your damnation. But everyone will bow. Make no mistake about it. So let's be sure. Let's be sure that our authority is Jesus Christ. And it's His Word, His will, His way that interests us, that impacts us, that influences us, and that expresses itself in the lives that we live in His name, to His glory. Let's pray together. Dear Holy Father, You're the God and Father of our Lord Jesus Christ, and we bow before You in Jesus' name. Oh, we thank You for that name. The name that is above every name. And we thank You that the name of Jesus is sweet to us. Because You have showed us our sin. And showed us the Savior. And convinced us that if we continue in our sin, we will perish eternally. At the same time, convinced us that Jesus is a willing and able Savior to save the worst of sinners and save us completely. So, oh God, help us. In this day when there are many voices crying out to us to make sure that we're listening to your voice. You've taught it in the Gospel of John that Jesus' sheep hear his voice. 
And the mark of our being a sheep is that we follow him. Help us to follow Jesus Christ as, as this culture casts more and more darkness over the land. And as increasingly we're going to be called upon to name the name of Jesus at great cost. May we embrace the Lordship of Christ without hesitation. May we demonstrate a student attitude, wanting to be taught by Him. Taught by the Spirit. Feeding upon the Word. Growing in grace and in the knowledge of the Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. For we ask this in His name and for His sake. Amen.